to a special edition of One North Main. I'm Mark Lindy, your host, and usually Jay Miller is the host, but today I'm going to do my annual Meet with the Mayor, talk about the city, talk about Brockton, the future, what's going on here in the City of Champions. Mayor, Bill, well, thank you Mark, for doing it's this. It's great to have you here in my office and uh, to spend a little time with your, with your viewers. Well, before it's election time, we do this right. every year. Right. Um, it's not electioneering, just no. for the record. Not yet. Um, I went to your State of the City address. We covered Thank it. You. We had it yeah. on, on cable TV. And uh, looks like the city is under construction. No, it is. Uh, 2019 is going to be a historic year for the city, uh, particularly downtown in terms of development and redevelopment. Um, between public and private uh, projects, uh, we're looking at about $150 million of new construction breaking ground in 2019. Mm -hmm. Two of those projects are already underway, the new parking garage and uh, 47 West Elm Street, uh, which we did a groundbreaking on just a couple weeks ago, and uh, 44 luxury market uh, rate apartments. And these are just the beginning. You know, we'll see several more projects breaking ground during the course of the year. I think we're finally able to see tangibly the work that's been done for the past, you know, four and a half, five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, investors are coming to Brockton. I think we've been able to establish Brockton now as a place that where people want to live in downtown Brockton and pay market value rents and be willing to or be able to walk to the commuter rail station. And uh, I think uh, we're, that's what we're marketing and we still have work to do. Uh, but it's exciting to watch this. Uh, it's, it's a mixed-use model where most of the projects are mixed-use, meaning that we've, we maintain commercial retail on the ground floor, but we're developing housing above it. And that's going to bring a whole wave of residents to the downtown who are people with good jobs and disposable income, and now the amenities will come in with it. So 47 West Elm Street is the first building that's going to look very different. That one's going to have right. parking. Right. On ground level, correct? Right, right. And then the apartments, are, and it's futuristic, it's modernistic. Yeah. If you go to Quincy and other places like that, you see a lot of those yeah. developments, so it's kind of a first for downtown. Yeah, the developer said that he modeled it after a, a couple of things he saw in uh, South Boston, South Boston Waterfront, which is probably the hottest place in the world right now. Absolutely. And uh, there's no question they're marketing to millennials uh, and going to offer that same type of living but for an extra 15 minutes on the train, being able to live here in Brockton for half of oh, what absolutely. it would cost in Quincy or Dorchester or South Boston. And, um, you know, we're, we're excited about the prospects. And, uh, you know, this has taken a team. We've got a lot of people uh, from our city planner, Rob May, to Robert Jenkins at the BRA, uh, the chamber, uh, the work that we've done here. And we've got everybody pulling in the same direction. And I think that... Uh, Going back to first hiring a city planner during my first year and bringing Rob May on board to developing a game plan for the downtown, the uh, downtown action strategy, getting George Durant in for three years as a TDI fellow. And uh, <clears throat> we've been able to build in, take advantage of numerous state tax incentive programs and zoning programs uh, to make it more attractive to develop in downtown Brockton. Long dormant buildings. Petronelli yes. Building, thank God that didn't go for the wrecking ball, 19 right. Main Street, Corcoran Building. Um, we're going to have an issue with people butting into construction and traffic, aren't we? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I think that uh, midsummer, everyone's going to be complaining about how you can't get through downtown because of all the construction, and my answer is going to be, isn't it beautiful? Not that I can eat any of it, but food is going yeah. to come to downtown Brockton. Well, There's a couple of restaurants in development. I so. think we announced uh, the one that might turn out to be the most exciting, and I, I am, I agree with you, we're thrilled that the Petronelli is going to be saved. 
Um, and we're confident that the developer that is redeveloping the building has historic restoration experts on his team and they are confident that they're going to be able to save the building. And that's good news. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this redevelopment we see will be a combination. It'll be a mix of saving the buildings that can be saved. Some, unfortunately, because they've been vacant for so many years, they've just deteriorated to the point where you, you can't save them. And in the Corcoran building, the Corcoran Plumbing Supply Building on North Montello Street, it is part of the downtown. Uh, we're really excited about the, that development. I think what's most exciting right now is that the developer already has a deal signed with a top-notch restaurant tour coming out of Providence to open a restaurant called the G-Pub. And the G-Pub has already exists in downtown Providence. It's in a building where they have the G-Pub downstairs in a place called the Rooftop, up on the roof, obviously. It's one of the hottest places in Providence mm -hmm. right now. They've started, they've decided to replicate the G-Pub. There's one under construction in Plymouth right now. And the third one will be in the Corcoran building here in Brockton. And they're really excited about the unique characteristics of the Corcoran building that they're going to be work, able to work around to create. This is going to be a destination uh, location. People are going to drive in from out of the city just to come to this uh, this restaurant, and it's going to be amazing. In the lot for the Kresge building, that's mixed That's 121 use. Main Street. That's mixed use. And... Uh, tentatively hoping for a restaurant on the ground floor there. <coughs> the, the ground floor space is being built out with the intent of putting a restaurant in. We haven't formally announced a restaurant there yet because they don't have a deal signed, mm -hmm. uh, but we understand they're close to signing a deal with a restaurant there. But that's another 40-something units of housing above it, but right on the corner uh, of um, Frederick Douglass in Maine, uh, will be, uh, we believe, another restaurant. And we're not even counting that one yet. Okay. 19 Main Street is a commitment for a restaurant. Uh, a developer out of Dorchester who's going to make most of that building into housing, which would match the other half of the block that's right. been housing for years. But again, they're going to maintain that storefront on the corner of Green and Main and develop that as a restaurant. That developer, his family, already owns and operates a restaurant. They're in the business. So... Um, you know, we, we knew that we've been working, I mean, since the day we got here, looking to, to, to bring restaurants downtown. And the two, the two questions we would always get from a restaurant tour was, number one, uh, where are the customers? And they would look around downtown and not see a lot of people that looked like they were ready to spend 50 bucks for a meal. Um, and then secondly, they would say, well, if I'm fortunate enough to draw the customers down here, where are they going to park? Right. Well, now we've reached that point in time where the new parking garage, it's not talk anymore. It's under construction, 414 spaces of additional parking downtown, well lit, clean, safe, <clears throat> excuse me, right in the heart of the downtown. And now with the two, 250 or so units of market rate housing that's in the pipeline right now, those are permitted, financed, and on their way, uh, now the restaurant tours that we've been talking to for a few years can now see the opportunity. They can see uh, market rate uh, renters, people coming into the downtown with disposable income that will be looking for places they can walk to, sure. uh, and along with the, the additional parking for the people that are drawn in from outside. So, And then throw in the new uh, the state office building going up at the Ganley, and uh, we're expecting to have a formal announcement in early May mm -hmm. uh, with some state officials here in terms of unveiling the design and, and confirming the timeline. But uh, I can tell you that that project will be under construction before the end of 2019. So what does market rate mean? There's a misnomer or misunderstanding out there that people think market rate means affordable housing. No, no. Market rate means what the market will bear. Okay. And that number keeps going up uh, at... Uh, um, 47 Pleasant, which is the one that has been completed already. That's the remake of the standard modern printing building. Right. Uh, those units at market rate, they go between 1400 and 1800 a month. Mm -hmm. um, th these are, uh, they're, they're not in the affordable range. Did we, you ever think you'd see that in Brockton? I believed it. I, I, when I, you the, first the vision, ran, you I, that's, about This it, yep. was the vision. Um, it's been a lot of work to get here. 
Uh, but now that it's finally happening, it's exciting. And I think that, and I understand, you know, over the, the past few years, we've been talking about the vision, but you couldn't really see a whole lot had changed. And, you know, Brocktonians have been hearing about new plans for the downtown for 30 years. And so I think a lot of folks, yeah, 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 well, you know, I'll see it when I believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. Well, now they're going to see it. I'll be honest with you, I'm yeah. one of those. Yeah. I, I've been a big promoter of the downtown. We were right. one of the first buildings to renovate, and right. we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. No, but you know what? It's typical downtown. So I've spent a lot of time in the past six years looking at other cities like Brockton that have had success transforming their downtowns. So whether you go and look in um, uh, Haverhill, Lowell, uh, Worcester, Salem, any of these cities, um, I think Worcester's a great example because they're ahead of everybody else. Um, but you, any of these cities you go to to visit, the, the construction of at least one parking structure was part of the plan that, that turned the downtown around. Because one of the things that's hurt us here is sprawl parking. The parking is spread out. Mm -hmm. But whether it's here or it's Worcester or it's Lowell or Lynn or wherever people want to go to, people, particularly at night, they don't want to park eight blocks away from where they're going out for dinner. Right. And that's typical of all cities, all right. downtowns. And so the, the model that works everywhere is you have to build a parking structure or two to make parking go vertical so that you open up all the area around it for redevelopment. Now over in the vicinity of the parking garage, the Petronelli building, <clears throat> there are three city-owned parking lots that will become available for redevelopment after the garage is open because the cars that are in those lots will go into the garage. Let's switch over to schools. You, yes. One of your roles is chair of the school committee. Correct. And you were a school committee member before you were mayor. Yep. The biggest question that everybody asks is equitable funding and what's going on with the lawsuit. Right. Uh, Brockton, Brockton was on the edge of education mm -hmm. reform, two different lawsuits. Right. Why is it taking so long and any new developments in that whole issue? Sure. Um, Brockton was a leader in the fight last time that led to the Education Reform Act of 93, the McDuffie and then Hancock cases, uh, led to the ed reform that got us Chapter 70 back in the early 90s. And from the early 90s to the early 2000s, uh, that funding formula worked for cities like Brockton. And our school system was thriving, and we were setting records uh, for an urban school district. But as time went on, the commitment that had been made when they established Chapter 70 to review it periodically never happened. Right. And in, in the last 10 to 15 years, 10, 12 years, um, the funding has become woefully inadequate for cities, gateway cities like Brockton. The legislature's own Foundation Budget Review Commission in 2015 came up with four major findings. And uh, it was that the formula does not cover teachers' health insurance and pensions. It does not cover the cost of special education. It does not cover the cost of English language learners. And it does not cover the cost of children growing up in poverty. So the first two most school districts have across the state. But as cities like whether it's Brockton, New Bedford, Worcester, um, we have a large percentage of children that are growing up at or below the federal poverty line. And we have about one third of our students in our system today are not proficient in English. Mm -hmm. We love these students, we embrace them, we're giving them the best education we possibly can. But there's no denying the fact that their education costs more money than the average mainstream student and we're not getting the additional funding to pay for it. So. Uh, I think we're working on two fronts. I first want to say we're working very hard with our legislative delegation to get reform in this budget. And I think that we have had discussions and looked at the possibility of a lawsuit for over a year. But because the legislature came close at the end of the last session and that we had reason to believe that in this budget cycle some real reform may happen, the legislative solution is the preferred solution. Sure. That's the one that gets us money now. The lawsuit sounds like we'll show them, we're going to sue them, but if it's five years before we see any money out of it, we've got five more classes of kids graduating from the Brockton schools that aren't getting sufficient resources. So we're looking at the legislative option first. Um, I'll tell you, we had a recent meeting with the Attorney General 
We've done a lot of work with Worcester and New Bedford and Brockton as the lead school districts. Other gateway cities are now coming to join us. Um, I'll be making an announcement during the month of May with those other two mayors. And I think that um, we have some top-notch law firms. The research is being done. I think we'll either get meaningful education funding reform by mid-July in this budget, or you will see a lawsuit go forward. And we believe it's a very strong case because what the court found back in 93 is that the quality of a child's public education in the Commonwealth cannot be dependent upon the local community's ability to raise property taxes. And Brockton does not have the same ability to raise property taxes that places like Situate and Cohasset and Dover and Wellesley have. And so it's fundamentally unconstitutional for the students here to be receiving, in some cases, thousands of dollars a year less per student in resources than their counterparts in more affluent suburbs have. So we've been fighting this battle hard. We're on the lead of this fight, and uh, I do believe this year uh, we will get meaningful reform or you'll see a lawsuit go forward that has been being worked on for over a year. Right. We, we, we were not interested in filing a frivolous complaint or something that would get immediately dismissed. Um, if we do go the litigation route, it will be a case that has a re reasonable chance to win. And in the meantime during the State of the City address, you announced that you were going to take surplus winter funds because we had yep. a mild winter That's right. and put it into a thousand laptops for Yep, I just actually filed that with the City Council today. So um, a little over $500,000 buys a thousand laptops for Brockton students. One of the areas where the disparity is the greatest is around technology. Uh, our kids just are not getting the technology that the surrounding towns have for their students. And uh, we've been working on towards a goal with the school committee for a couple of years now to get to one-to-one -to -one devices, which is common in most of the other school districts. We're working to get there. This will get us another step closer. Um, you know, for this is my sixth winter. For the first time, we had a surplus. I've had five snow deficits sure. in a row, finally a surplus. And I really gave a lot of thought to what the options were with that money. And I felt the majority of it had to go to our kids in this form of technology because <clears throat> it's a critical need we need to answer right now. That money won't be sitting in next year's budget. It's a chance to make a real difference right now. We're heading into budget season. We're in April. Uh, budget is all to you. <clears throat> it goes to the council in, in June. Correct. What's the budget forecast? We're still probably 30 days away, Mark, from knowing the real answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the biggest challenge we face budget-wise the last two or three years has been the deficit on the school side mm -hmm. because th the impact of these deficits on the school side was so devastating that in the last two budgets I took every dollar we could find and sent it over to the schools to offset some, just some, of the damage that was being done by the underfunding by the state. Um, I think that this year Looking at the House budget that just came out of Ways and Means, there's reason to believe that the funding will be better from the state this year, and we may not have to send that money to the schools. In the past two years, we have sent more than $5 million in excess of what the foundation budget required. In other words, from the, the, the amount of money that we were required to send, we sent an additional $5 million. It's a lot of money to a city like Brockton. And we've had to really live with some cuts on the city side to allow us to do that. I, I believe right now, and it's still a little early to tie it all up, I think this is going to be a stable budget. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there will be any drastic cuts. I don't think there'll be any money left over. Um, but if we could get that, that would be, a, that would be progress uh, over what, what, what we had, what we came into since the day we arrived here. How's the charter school affected it? It keeps going up because they keep offering more services and the money goes with the kids, including yeah. things like regional transportation money that affects right. a school like yep. Southeastern, where I'm on the school committee yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. So I've never complained about the money that we pay to Southeastern Regional. I know that. I, the Brockton kids that go there get a fantastic education. You know that I'm a, I'm a, a big supporter of that school. I think I'm the first mayor to attend their graduation every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more than 60% of the students over there are Brockton students. 
and I believe in what they're doing there with vocational technical education, but also preparing kids for college if they decide to go that route. There just aren't enough seats there. However, when we talk about the charter school, it's a different story. And cities like Brockton are getting killed on charter schools. In this year's budget, they will deduct $15 million from Brockton for charter school tuition and only give us $3 million of reimbursement because they're taking all of it away and they're not even giving us as much reimbursement as they promised when they put this system in place. Well, that means our school budget is starting out $12 million in the hole before we even start. That's a number that's impossible to overcome without making cuts for our kids. And so, I mean, I can spend an hour telling you why the charter school funding is unfair, but at the end of the day, the current system it balances the cost of charter schools on the backs of the school districts that can least afford to pay it, like Brockton. And it's wrong and it needs to be changed. Two things in the state of the city, I was going to say State of the Union, right. address that came out are um, term limits and sanctuary cities. Yeah, so sanctuary city, I know a couple councilors criticized me for addressing the issue in the state of the city. I don't know why. I think the state of the city is to speak directly to the residents of the city about the issues and challenges that are facing the city. That I get asked more questions when I'm out in public about this proposed ordinance that the council is considering right now, and they can call it whatever they want. It's a sanctuary city ordinance. If it passes, it will put restrictions on the police department's ability to work with federal law enforcement agencies. That's sanctuary city. They can call it whatever they want. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's a sanctuary city ordinance. Um, it, it would also put us in a very difficult spot with federal law enforcement agencies. You know, we just spent how much time talking about all the development. If five or six years worth of work to finally bring this millions of dollars of development into the city. Do you know those developers are calling me since this thing was filed and said, what's up with Sanctuary City? Do we have to rethink our investment in Brockton? So I believe that the majority of Brockton residents do not want this type of ordinance. I think it's totally unnecessary. The things they're trying to protect against don't happen here. So the Brockton Police Department doesn't ask victims of crime what their immigration status is. They don't ask people reporting crimes what their status is. federal says. funds if it was a sanctuary Potentially. City? That's a subject to the courts right now. Okay. Um, so that is another potential hit that I have to worry about because we rely on millions and millions of dollars of federal assistance every year. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, and I talked a little bit about it in the speech, we rely on our partners in all the federal law enforcement agencies with the resources and manpower that they bring in here on a daily basis to work with us. And that's been part of this successful strategy in reducing crime is increasing our collaboration with county, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. I'm not going to jeopardize the help of those federal law enforcement agencies, uh, and I am not going to tie the hands of the police department behind their back. Gangs, guns, drugs. If you're involved in one of those three things, then we need to use every tool we have in the toolkit to get you out of our city. And that includes immigration status. If you're not involved in gangs, guns, or drugs, you have nothing to worry about. We've never held, in my five and a half years as mayor, we have not held someone in custody based upon their immigration status. But I'm gonna tell you, when we're dealing with gang members and illegal guns and drug dealers, I am not going to take that tool away from our police department. I just won't do it. The term limits. Interesting. In, yeah. I found that very interesting. Now, does that apply to retroactively? Me and my, my question oh. is, uh, you know, if someone's yeah. a city councilor for 20 years right, and they have five terms, do they get, can they potentially have five more terms after that? 20 years they've already um, served? or I believe the way that we'll file it, the answer will be no. I think if they ever pass it, the answer will be yes. I think that they will amend it to grandfather themselves. I put this out there for discussion, and I, I respect uh, the feelings of many of the counselors that I have excellent working relationships with that think I'm wrong on this one. But again, I, I go by what I hear from people when, I, when I'm out walking around the city and whether I'm in the store, the supermarket, getting my hair cut, whatever it is. Um, and I think the, the majority of residents feel as though 
people stay in one office too long. Now, if someone serves 10 years in the school committee, under my proposal, they could run for city council, they sure. could run for mayor. All I'm suggesting is 10 consecutive years in the same office is enough. Let's turn it over and give some opportunities for new candidates to come in with new ideas, new energy. I think it would be good, and I think that was the intent of the democracy when it was formed back in, in the 1770s. You mentioned so, Washington in your yeah. speech, and if it's good enough for the President of the United States to have eight years. Well, if you look at mayors around most of the country, when you get outside of New England, by far the most common model for mayors is just like President. It's a four-year term limited to two consecutive terms. Um, I think that's a lot better than the system we have of a two-year term where, and not just because I happen to be the mayor right now, but it forces whoever the mayor is to be constantly running for re-election. Every other year you have to campaign. Campaigning takes, no matter how hard you try not to, campaigning has to take some time away from the time you would normally be spending on your duties as mayor. It's bad government. It's tough to make good long-term decisions when most of the time those long-term decisions come with short-term pain. Well, and are you going to really self-inflict pain six months before an election? No. no so um, I, I think for a lot of reasons, it does need to be a four-year term. New Bedford has gone to a four-year term. Quincy has gone to a four-year term. Um, Springfield is a four-year term. So I, I, that's the direction I think we need to go. So what haven't I asked you about that you haven't been able to talk about either in the oh. newspaper or, you know, in the state of the city? Is there anything I missed that we haven't well, touched? Well, I, I think the bottom line uh, is that anyone that looks at Brockton as an independent observer would say that we're moving forward in the right direction, that the city is better positioned today than it was five and a half years ago when we arrived. I think you can see the evidence of it. Um, as I said in the speech, buildings are going up, crime is coming down. Those are the critical issues along with education and jobs. Jobs come from business. Uh, business is expanding here. Uh, so buildings are going up, crime is coming down. We have made real progress. The perception of this city is changing. People are paying record prices to purchase homes in this city today. Uh, we've got hundreds of new people coming to downtown to pay top dollar rent. Um, I believe we've got Brockton on the right track. But our job isn't done yet, and we still have more work to do, and uh, I hope that I'm fortunate enough to, to continue to lead that effort. Public safety complex, you, you, you yep. mentioned that. I know there's been discussion yep. with the CSX mm -hmm. rail yard area. Yep. Um, that is a lot. That's a can that's been kicked right. down the road and I'm, for the and last I, right. five administrations. And I'm, and I'm not sure that the CSX site is necessarily the site. However, what I do know is both our police headquarters and our, and our fire headquarters are woefully uh, inadequate and outdated and outmoded and unsafe. And we have to realize that we've got to start doing something. We, as you said, we can't just keep kicking that can down the road. Um, I think we've, we've made a lot of progress in public safety, but until we have 21st century facilities for our public safety personnel to work out of, we're not going to get there. So I envision a public safety campus that would contain a police station and a fire station, headquarters for both, not necessarily in the same building, separate buildings, but on the same campus. And this need was pointed out in the master facility study that was completed for the city last year. Uh, I just filed also today the rest of the snow surplus money, $250,000. That'll be about half the cost of having the planning done to get to a conceptual plan of what a public safety campus would look like and recommending a couple of top locations. We've got to start working on it. Someone says to me, we can't afford it. I say, we can't afford not to anymore. Right. And we have to move forward on it. And this planning process alone will take a couple of years. And we are thinking about how you would finance it and look at that. And we need all that planning to come together. But we have to build state-of-the-art 21st century public safety facilities, police, fire, communications. We need them to keep the city safe. Well, thank you for taking the time. No, thank you, Mark. Great Always to see you. Always a pleasure, it. and uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, special edition of uh, 
on North Main. Hey, Peter Zimbor does a great job producing that 30-minute show for us every week. I think we just try to highlight some of the good things going on around the city that you may not necessarily read about in the newspaper. And I am amazed when I get out there talking to people, uh, I never knew how many people watch local community access. But people talk to me about the TV show all the time, so I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.